Just last Thursday, on October 9th, this incredible website was featured as site of the day on awards and one of the standout elements that caught my eye right away was this immersive full-screen 3D menu overlay. As soon as you open the menu, your cursor drives a dynamic parallax effect, rotating a 3D model in the background in real time. And layered on top of that, there is a point light that follows your cursor, certainly highlighting different parts of the model as you move around. I found the whole concept really well executed and super engaging. Also, it's been a while since we last explored a 3D experience here on the channel, so this felt like the perfect inspiration to bring some of that back into the mix. So after a few hours of experimenting, I put together this interactive overlay menu powered by 3JS and GSAP that recreates a similar parallax effect using a free model I grabbed from Sketchfab. Now of course, on production sites like the one we saw earlier, these 3D environments are often custom built, crafted to match the brand's visual identity tailored specifically for that experience, but for this rebuild, I am using a placeholder model just to show how easily you can bring 3D assets and real-time interaction into any modern website layout. In this video, I will walk you through exactly how to build this from scratch using 3JS and show you how to wire it up to user input for such smooth, responsive motion. If you find these kinds of rebels helpful, be sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you'd like to access the source code for this project, plus hundreds of other similar micro projects and a brand new website template every month, you can check out the pro membership via the link in the description. Alright, let's jump into the code. Let's start with the basic HTML structure. At the very top, we have got a simple navigation bar with a logo on the left and a menu toggler on the right. Right below that, we have the main overlay element. This is the full screen container that appears when the menu opens. Inside it, we have placed two things, a canvas element which is where our 3JS scene will render and a set of menu links that stack vertically on the right side of the screen. Each link sits inside its own menu item div, giving us individual control for styling and hover animations later on. We have got a few placeholder titles here, but you can easily replace these with your own navigation links when you build this out for your site. Finally, at the bottom, we have added a simple hero section with a headline just to give the page a bit of context and something to look at behind the overlay. This hero's heading will also help us see how the menu transitions over real content when it animates in. And that's all we need for the HTML, just a clean layout with a nav, a hero and the full screen menu overlay that we'll bring to life next with CSS and JavaScript. Alright, now that our structure is in place, let's start styling everything. First of all, I'm bringing in a clean, geometric font called Mendrope from Google Fonts. It's modern, minimal and fits perfectly with the kind of aesthetic we are going for here. Next, I'm resetting all the default browser spacing, so everything starts from a clean slate that just helps us keep the layout consistent and predictable as we build. Then for the overall look, I'm giving the page a deep, dark background just for now. And for the typography, we are keeping things clean and bold with Mandrope as the main typeface throughout. Now for the big headings, I'm styling them to feel oversized and strong with tight spacing and all caps. Next, I will take care of the smaller text elements, the links and the labels. They are all uppercase as well, slightly smaller and semi-bold so they balance nicely against the larger headings. The text color is set to white so it pops clearly against the dark background or the image. And just to make the interactions feel smoother, I have disabled text selection so it doesn't highlight when you click or drag over it. Now let's move to the navigation bar. It stays fixed at the top, spanning the full width with some breathing room around the edges. Inside, the logo sits on one side and the menu toggler on the other, both slightly padded so they are easy to click. The layout uses a simple horizontal alignment to keep everything balanced and minimal. Next up, the overlay. This is the full screen layer that appears when we open the menu. Right now, it's hidden by default with no interaction but will bring it to life with GSAP shortly. The background is a slightly lighter tone of grey than the main page, just enough to separate it visually. And we have also enabled GPU acceleration for smooth opacity transitions later on. Inside that overlay, the canvas stretches across the entire screen, that's the space where our 3JS model will render and react to the mouse movement. Over it, we have the column of menu links aligned neatly on the right side of the screen, Each link feels large and bold, will later animate a white gradient feel across each word when you hover over them, creating that signature text highlighting effect. 
Then we have the hero section behind everything. It takes up the full screen with a background image that fills the space edge to edge. The main heading sits near the bottom corner in bright white, giving us that contrast-free cinematic composition beneath the menu overlay. Finally, I have added a few responsive adjustments for smaller screens. On mobile, the big heading scaled down to fit naturally within the viewport and the menu links stack vertically with a bit more padding and comfortable spacing. The layout remains simple, balanced and perfectly legible even when the 3D overlay is active. And that's it for the styling. We have now set the visual foundation for the experience, clean, minimal and ready for motion. Next, we'll jump into the JavaScript and start wiring up the menu interactions with GSAP and then build out the 3D scene using 3JS. First, I'm loading everything we'll need, the 3D library, a loader that lets us import external models and GSAP for all the smooth animations we'll be building throughout this project. Next, I'm waiting until the page is fully loaded before running any of the scripts that just make sure all the elements on the page are ready to be selected and animated instead of trying to reference them before they exist. Then, I'm grabbing three main elements from the layout, the menu button at the top, the full screen overlay that covers the screen when the menu opens, and the small label inside the button so we can update its text as we toggle between states. Now, I'm setting up two simple conditions to help control everything smoothly. One keeps track of whether the menu is currently open or closed, and the other keeps track of whether the animation is still playing. This way, if someone clicks repeatedly while the transition is happening, it won't trigger any glitches or double animations. Next, I'm listening for a click on the menu button. As soon as it's clicked, I check if we are already made animation. If we are, I simply stop there so nothing overlaps. If not, I flip the menu state, either opening or closing it, and mark that an animation is in progress. When the menu is opening, I use GSAP to fade the overlay in smoothly. At the start of that animation, I re-enable its interactivity so we can hover over the links and move the cursor over the 3D scene behind them. Once the fade completes, I mark the animation as done and update the text on the menu button to close. When we click again, the opposite happens. The overlay fades back out, its interactivity turns off, and once the transition finishes, we reset the button text back to menu. It's a very simple sequence, but it creates that clean, polished opening and closing motion you often see on high-end websites. With that done, we now have a functional and seamless toggle system. Our menu opens and closes gracefully, the overlay fades in and out, and the button stays perfectly in sync. Next, we'll add some subtle motion to the menu links themselves, so when we hover over each item, it feels dynamic and alive before we move on to the 3D scene setup. First, I'm grabbing all the individual menu items inside the overlay. Then, I'm looping through each one and listening for when the user hovers over it. As soon as the cursor enters, we trigger a GSAP animation that expands the white highlight across the text. This creates a smooth feel effect, almost like the text is being revealed from left to right. It's subtle but adds that feeling of refinement that we saw on the original site. When the cursor leaves, we simply reverse that effect. The highlight fades back down to its original muted color. It happens quickly so it feels snappy and responsive. So now, each link reacts independently so you can move your cursor up and down the list and see that gentle pulse of motion follow you around. And that's all we need for the hover animations. It plays a huge role in how polished the overall experience feels. Next, we'll start setting up the 3D environment inside the canvas, bringing in the model, the lights and the camera and connecting everything so the background responds dynamically to our cursor movement. Before creating the scene itself, I like to start by defining a simple configuration object. This is where we'll store all the key settings, things like the model path, lighting values, camera positions, and overall material look. Having everything in one place makes it easier to tweak and experiment later without having to dig through the code. First, I'm setting a background color for the canvas, a deep gray tone that blends nicely with the rest of the layout and the model. Then I'm defining the path to our 3D model file. In this case, we are using a GLP model that I downloaded from Sketchfab just for this demo. You can find the link in the description. Next, I'm setting up a few surface properties, metalness and roughness, which control how reflective or matte the model appears when light hits it. A higher metalness gives the surface a metallic sheen, while a bit of roughness softens the reflections so they don't feel too harsh. After that, we are defining the base camera setup. This includes the zoom level along with its starting position on the X, Y and Z axis. You'll notice we are making a small adjustment depending on screen size. On mobile, the camera sits centered, but on desktop, it shifts slightly to the side for a more cinematic framing of the model. 
Then we have the base rotation values which simply define how the model sits when it first loads, whether it's facing forward, tilted slightly or rotated in any direction. You can play around these values based on the model you are using. For now, we are keeping all of these to zero so the model starts neutral and upright. Next comes the lighting configuration. We are using a mix of ambient, directional and accent lights to give the model shape and depth. Each one has its own intensity and position which helps sculpt how light falls across different surfaces. For example, the ambient light fills in darker areas while the key and rim lights define the main highlights and edges. This combination adds contrast and realism to the scene without overexposing anything. Finally, there is the cursor light setup. This is the small dynamic light that follows your mouse across the screen. Here, we are controlling how bright it is, how far it reaches, how quickly it fades and how smoothly it follows your movement. We are also including a sensitivity setting for the parallax effect for how much the model reacts to mouse movement along the x and y axis. That's what creates that subtle parallax rotation as you move your cursor around. All of these settings together define the look and behavior of the entire scene. It's a neat way to centralize everything. If you ever want to change the model or tweak how the lighting feels or adjust the camera for a different layout, you can just modify the numbers here instead of changing the animation logic later. Now that our configuration is ready, we'll move on to setting up the actual 3JS scene, creating the camera, the renderer and all the lights that will bring our 3D model to life. First of all, I'm creating a new scene. This is like our digital stage. Everything we add from this point on, whether it's lights, models or effects, will exist inside this space. I am also giving the scene the same background color we defined earlier so it matches seamlessly with the rest of the layout. Next, I am setting up the camera. We are using a perspective camera which mimics how we naturally see depth in real life. Objects closer to us appear larger and those further away get smaller. The camera has a moderately wide view which keeps the model frame nicely in the center while leaving enough room for the light and parallax effects to breathe. Then I am connecting it all to our canvas. This canvas is where everything will be rendered visually. It's like the window through which we'll see the entire 3D world. I'm creating a renderer that will draw all the elements from the scene into that canvas in real time. I've also turned on a few quality settings to make the visual smoother and more realistic. Anti-aliasing is enabled to soften rough edges and the pixel ratio is adjusted based on the user's device that helps keep things sharp without overloading performance. Shadows are enabled as well using a soft mapping method so the light transitions feel natural and cinematic. And finally, I've activated tone mapping and color correction to ensure brightness and contrast look more than just a flat render. Once that's ready, we can start lighting the scene. I'm adding a few different lights, each serving a specific role, just like the studio setup for product photography. First comes the ambient light. This is the soft global light that fills in the dark areas of the model and make sure nothing is completely lost in shadow. Next is the key light. Think of this as the main source of illumination. It defines the direction and shape of our shadows. It's positioned slightly above and to the side of the model and it's also set to cast shadows to make the scene feel grounded. I have given it a fairly high quality shadow map so the details stay crisp even when you zoom in close. After that, I'm adding a fill light on the opposite side to soften those shadows and bring back some balance. This prevents the dark areas from feeling too heavy or flat. Then we have the rim light positioned behind the model to catch the edges with a bright highlight. That's what gives the object its outline and helps it stand out cleanly against the dark background. Finally, I'm adding a subtle top light that mimics the effect of overhead lighting. It adds just a bit of extra reflection and depth across the upper surface of the model. Altogether, these lights create a balanced, layered look that highlights the form of the model without making it look overly stylized. It's the kind of lighting setup you'll often see in polished 3D showcase sites, realistic but still soft and design driven. Now that our scene, camera and lighting are in place, we are ready to bring in the actual 3D model and start positioning it so it feels perfectly centered inside this environment. First, I'm using a model loader to import our GLB file, the same one we defined earlier in the configuration. Once it loads, I store the scene that comes with it inside a variable. That's the full 3D object we'll be adding into our environment. Before adding it to the scene, I'm going through every part of the model to make a few adjustments. If that part is a mesh, meaning it has a visible surface, I'm enabling shadows so it can both cast and receive light correctly. I'm also updating the material to use the metalness and roughness values from our configuration so the surface behaves exactly how we want it to when the light hits it. Next, I'm calculating the model's overall size and its center point. This helps us figure out where our 3D object sits in space. Because different models can come with different origins, some centered, 
zoom off to the side. By measuring its bounding box, we can move it so it's perfectly centered in the frame no matter what model we use. Then I'm setting the initial position of the model in the scene. I'm using the same offset we defined earlier for the camera. This makes sure the model sits at the right spot in front of the camera rather than floating too high or sitting below the frame. After that, I'm setting its phase rotation. Right now it's neutral, but we'll start introducing interactive movement shortly. I'm also adjusting the camera's distance so the model fits nicely within the frame with just enough breathing room around it to make it feel balanced. And finally, once all that is ready, we add the model into the scene. Now at this stage, I'm adding a temporary animation function just so we can see what happens on the screen. It's a simple render loop that continuously updates the frame. So even if the model isn't moving yet, we'll still see it lit and ready inside the canvas. Later on, we'll replace this with a single unified animation function once we have built out all the logic. For now, I'm including a separate animation function after each major step. That way, I can show you what each section of code is doing as we build this project piece by piece. Inside this first run, we are just updating the scene continuously and redrawing it using the camera. You should now see your model sitting perfectly centered and illuminated by the lights you added earlier. Next, I am making the layout responsive. When the browser window resizes, the camera updates its shape, the renderer adjusts its rotation, and the model repositions slightly to stay aligned within the viewport. This ensures that even if someone opens the menu on smaller screen, everything remains properly scaled and centered. Now let's start making it interactive. I am setting up variables to track the cursor's movement both horizontally and vertically and defining a few values that will control how smoothly the model responds. Every time you move the mouse, I am mapping those positions to a range between negative 1 and 1. So when you move to the edges of the screen, the model knows exactly how far to rotate. Then, inside the animation loop, I am taking those mouse values and turning them into gentle rotation targets. The further we move the mouse to the right, the more the model rotates in that direction and the further we move it upward or downward, the more it tilts accordingly. I am also using smooth interpolation here. That's what makes the motion feel fluid rather than twitchy. It eases toward the new position gradually, giving that slow, graceful parallax movement that feels really natural. So right now, as you move your cursor across the screen, the 3D model should start responding, certainly rotating left, right, up and down. And every frame, the scene re-renders in real time, keeping everything perfectly in sync. That's the core of our 3D interactivity, the moment that makes this overlay feel alive. Next, we'll start layering in the lighting interaction, the point light that follows your cursor and adds those dynamic highlights across the model surface. That's what gives it that final touch of realism and depth. First, I'm creating a small point light and adding it to the scene. This light acts like a moving spotlight, following your mouse position and gently highlighting different parts of the model as you move around. Its brightness, distance and fade are all coming from the configuration we defined earlier, so it feels soft and natural rather than harsh or overexposed. Right now, I'm placing it just in front of the model, facing toward it. We'll also make sure it's only visible when the cursor light is enabled in our settings. Next, I'm setting up a few variables to help control how smoothly this light follows the cursor. As the mouse moves, I'm capturing its position and mapping it to a small range that the light can move within. This gives us a target position for the light, both horizontally and vertically, based on where the mouse is on screen. It doesn't jump instantly, instead, it gently eases toward the target, almost like it's gliding behind your cursor with a slight delay. Then, we move into the animation loop. Inside it, I'm updating both the model and the light in real time. The model still reacts to your cursor movement with that smooth parallax rotation, tilting ever so slightly as you move across the screen. At the same time, the point light follows your cursor, creating those soft highlights that roll across the surface as the object moves. Both of these movements work together, the rotation gives you depth, and the light gives you realism. Finally, the scene is re-rendered every frame, keeping the lighting and motion perfectly in sync. At this point, I am merging everything into a single function that updates every frame. Earlier, we created multiple animation loops, one after each major step, just so you could see what each block was doing in isolation. But now that everything is built, we don't need those separate loops anymore. We'll remove the previous ones and keep just this final unified animation function that handles everything at once. And that's it. Our 3D overlay is complete. We now have a full screen menu with dynamic parallax movement, interactive lighting, and smooth transitions powered by GSAP and 3JS. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.